Hello, everyone. Uh, please come and find your seats. Uh, move forward to the front if possible. This is a live session, so we will have a possibly a time of Q&A at the end. And if you have a question, please come to the mic that's in the middle and you'll be able to ask those questions so that everyone online can hear you. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, if you need your CEU uh, sheet stamped, uh, we have a room monitor in the back corner over there waving his hand. Uh, see him. And I think that is going to cover us for announcements um, for our presentation. Starting right after lunch here, we have the uh, Renton team that is going to do preliminary design and outreach for replacing of an aging wastewater lake line. Uh, Cheyenne Thompson has nine years of experience with design and permitting for municipal stormwater, wastewater pump station, and conveyance projects. Her primary design focus is civil site, including earthwork and utility improvement, in addition to uh, condition assessments and alternative analysis. And then Joe Stowell is the wastewater utility engineering manager for the city of Renton, Washington, having 27 years of experience in design management and delivery of wastewater CIPP projects from small projects up to a $140 million uh, MBR treatment plant. So please uh, welcome Cheyenne and Joe. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, once again, my name's Joe Stowell. I'm the wastewater utility engineering manager with the city of Renton. And it's Cheyenne Thompson, Rollo, and she did the bulk of the work. I'm just here to be the, the mouthpiece for the city. But you know, when we were preparing this presentation, I was really worried that you guys would have trouble reading the font on the screen. I don't think that's gonna be an issue today. So, but if you do have trouble, you can move forward 23 rows or something like that. And be just... So what we're here to talk about today is, is a lake line project. And it's kind of hard to describe without getting to it a little bit deeper. We have presented to PNCWA before early on in the project and we're back again to kind of give you a milestone update. For those of you, you know, I've, I've talked to a few people that don't even know where Renton is or some of them think it's Redmond. So just to cover all the bases for everybody in the room, uh, we're about a half hour south, uh, southeast of uh, Seattle at the south end of Lake Washington. We're, we're at the home of the Seahawks. And no more cheers than that. Uh, well, and then on the flip side, we're also the home of where they make the 737 Max. So we cover both ends of the spectrum. But uh, in any case, uh, the project itself is located uh, along the north end of, of Renton, um, right on the waterfront. It's kind of a weird deal that we ended up with. I, when I first moved to the area, I, I came from Nevada originally. What the heck is a lake line? Why did they do this? Uh, so what it was is back in the day, they had all the outfalls going straight into the lake and Clean Water Act comes along and Metro and whatnot. And so they installed a, a sewer main in the lake that captured all these outfalls from these homes. And so it follows the contours of the, the bottom of the lake. So it has some ups and downs. And the way we get everything through there is we, we pull some water out of the lake at the south end where the flush station's at introduce it in, get the velocity, get the flow through to the other end to the north end of the project where it's lifted up and given to King County for treatment. So uh, there's, oh, I should go back. I didn't cover everything. So we have this reasonable distance, 4,700 feet. Um, it serves 55 properties. 54 of those are homes. So you can imagine uh, the fun we've had with that. Uh, and it's, uh, and I've already mentioned the combination system. And from that, I'm going to hand it over to Cheyenne to do the technical part of it and the public outreach. And then I'll jump back in at the end to talk about policy stuff for the city. All right. So, why does the lake line need to be replaced? Um, these photos are from a condition assessment that was done in 2018. You can see the lake line was originally installed, um, buried. Okay, can you hear me now? All right. Um, it was originally buried, but over time, the lake bed has eroded and it's now exposed on the lake bed and unsupported in places. You can also see that it's only a few inches away from some of the near shore structures like docks. Um, so it's at risk for damage from boat anchors and settlement um, and just doesn't really have any protection. 
here's some more photos from the condition assessment. You can see that there's some pitting and graphitization happening to the cast iron pipe. Um, this photo on the right here is from one of the laterals, which are actually in worse condition than the lake line itself. Um, but the cement mortar lining is delaminating from the inside of the pipe and collecting in the pipe, which they've seen from previous cleaning activities. Um, part of the condition assessment was estimating the remaining useful life of the pipe. And it's not that the lake line is ready to burst. Um, it's just that it, it's at risk of a blockage. If any part of it is blocked, then none of the system will work. It needs flow to be able to go from the flush station at the south end all the way to the lift station at the north end um, in order for those 55 properties to be served. Um, and then again, just risk of damage from outside factors like a boat anchor or settlement and, and breaking apart those joints. So one thing I, that was part of the condition assessment was a hydraulic modeling of the lake line system. And when the model was initially set up, they were finding that the model was not really matching up with the observed hydraulic grade line in the field until they started modeling some partial blockages in the system. So that led to the city undertaking an emergency cleaning project. And just to illustrate how complicated that is, uh, all of the cleaning equipment needs to be brought in on a barge, uh, starting out at the Puget Sound, uh, traveling through the Ballard Locks, all the way through Lake Union, through Lake Washington, just to get down uh, to the lake line location uh, near the south end of the lake. Here's some more photos of that emergency cleaning project. So there are three existing in-water manholes that were accessed uh, by these aluminum caissons that were installed on top of those. All of the cleaning work had to be done from a vector truck on a barge. On um, this middle photo shows just how close they have to get to shore in order to access those manholes and do the cleaning. So it's really shallow water. It's in between all these private docks and it, the work is just really challenging to do. Um, this cleaning project, they removed approximately two tons of cleaning debris through this effort. They were able to access 80% of the lake line, not 100% of the lake line. Um, and just this cleaning effort cost almost a million dollars. So that was a temporary improvement to the lake line. And that's when the city started looking in more detail at a permanent solution to the lake line. So this led to the alternatives analysis. So what were the alternatives for either replacing or reconstructing the lake line system to get it out of the lake or replace it in the lake? So the alternatives that were considered were a new lake line, either along its existing alignment um, or deeper in the lake where it's more protected from boats and erosion. The next alternative was individual lift stations or grinder pumps. So one on every single property to pump the waste up to the, to the adjacent roadway. The next alternative was trying to construct a gravity sewer on land. So that would be either in the adjacent roadway or trying to squeeze it along the shoreline. And then the next alternative was a vacuum sewer system. So a vacuum system, instead of pumping, just vacuum up to the adjacent roadway. So the technical feasibility of all of those alternatives was considered. And the gravity sewer on land was one that was eliminated. You can see from this photo just how close the houses are together and the laterals to catch those in the backyard and bring them around the front. It just is too deep to construct when there's four or five feet in between the homes. The other alternative that was eliminated was the vacuum sewer. Uh, the system is limited to 13 feet of total elevation change between um, where the laterals are intercepted and the adjacent roadway, and we exceed that elevation um, along this alignment in several places. So this led to the selection of the preferred alternative, which is the individual lift stations or grinder pumps. Um, the biggest improvement is constructability. This is now a land-based system, not trying to install it in the lake. Uh, that also leads to long-term maintenance and accessibility improvements. They don't have to bring all their equipment in on a barge just to do cleaning or maintenance. Um, the other deciding factor was the likelihood of permit success. So with Section 404 of the Clean Water Act um, and the various hydraulic codes that apply here, 
Um, if there is a solution that brings the wastewater line out of the lake that is technically feasible and reasonable to construct, then you're obligated to pursue that over the in-water option. And lastly, we determined at a planning level that it's one of the more cost-effective solutions. So just with how difficult it is to construct a sewer in the lake, um, of those three technically feasible alternatives, the grinder pumps or the individual lift stations, um, came in at a much lower cost than trying to rebuild a new lake line. Here's a schematic of what that uh, individual lift station alternative looks like. If you can see on the screen here, um, we would intercept the existing laterals, which right now discharge directly into the lake line and reroute those to a new grinder pump station on each of the 55 properties along the alignment. Um, that would pump up to the adjacent roadway where a new small diameter force main would be installed uh, to pump to the nearest city of Renton uh, gravity main further up the hill. Uh, one other thing that we're showing here is uh, an electrical service connection to the lift station, which we'll talk into more detail later, but the original concept was to connect to the existing residential electrical service to power the lift station. So just a quick recap of what we've talked about so far. Uh, the lake line was originally constructed in 1971. The city started looking into what to do with it in 2000 with the first lake line study. Um, there have been some improvements to the access and flush stations in 2004 to 2005, um, followed by the condition assessment and cleaning that was done in 2016 to 2018, which the photos were from. And then the alternatives analysis that led to the selection of the individual lift stations in 2019 to 2020. So that brings us to where we are today, uh, which is we are now in the preliminary design. So zero to 30% of that individual lift station concept. Um, we hope to move to final design next year and then construction starting potentially as early as 2025. So now I'll talk a little bit more about the preliminary design and outreach for the current phase that we're in. Um, these are the main steps that we are, have done or are currently working our way through, but we started with a, a site walk for the design team. Um, there are 55 properties and none of them are the same. So it was helpful to get eyes on those conditions, um, followed by a, the topographic survey and aerial photography. Then we use that to prepare individual site plans for all 55 of the properties. We took those individual site plans and met with each of the 55 property owners one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we got we used the feedback that we got from those meetings um, to update our design and, and finalize, we're working on finalizing the 30% design. So outreach has been a significant component of where we are now. I'll talk about a few of those steps in a little bit more detail, but the aerial photography was something that has been a really helpful tool for us. This snapshot here is an example of what that looks like. These are high resolution photos taken from an airplane uh, that we're using to supplement the survey. Uh, the survey might show that there is a paved patio in the backyard, but not that it's a marble kitchen with a built-in fireplace that we don't want to disturb and, and have to restore. So it's been a really helpful tool for us to supplement with the survey. One kind of unique condition that you can see in this photo is the adjacent roadway is really narrow. It's more of a private drive. And that's actually part of King County Parks and Rec property as part of the trail development. But essentially the city of Renton operates and utilizes that as if it were right away. So here's an example of the individual site plans that we prepared. So again, we did this for each of the 55 properties. Um, it was just a, a conceptual sketch of here is where the individual lift station might work on your property. Here is where we think your existing side sewer is. Um, these are the sections that we think we would be trenching through your yard versus directionally drilling up to the street um, and where the lake line is uh, relative to your connections. So these are the plans that we took 
to meet with every property owner. So now I'll talk about some of the feedback that we got, starting with the positive feedback. Um, in general, the residents were supportive that the city is taking a proactive approach to this project. Um, they're not waiting until the lake line reaches the end of its useful life or until there's a blockage. Um, they're also supportive of the fact that this project is funded by the city's rates. A lot of the residents were concerned that they would have a significant cost burden um, with the change in the system. The other item that they like to see was removing the lake manholes down to lake bed depth, just to reduce obstacles for boaters and swimmers. And lastly, they're looking forward to having improved roadway drainage. You can see from this photo that the road's in pretty poor condition. Um, it collects a lot of drainage from the trail and we expect that we'll be repaving essentially all of the road to install that uh, small diameter force main. So now that we covered the good feedback, we'll get into some of their concerns. Um, these are the, the primary concerns that we saw and I'll talk a, a little bit more about each of them in more detail. But the first question we got was why grinder pumps? Uh, next was the maintenance responsibility, whether or not these have monitoring capabilities, if there are going to be any shared stations and what we're doing about emergency storage and backup power. And this snapshot here is from an online open house that we also did just to educate residents about the project and let them know what's going on. It was another platform that we were soliciting feedback from the residents, but we really didn't start to get any feedback until we met one-on-one, -on -one, which is where we really started to hear what people were concerned about. So the, one of the main questions we got was why grinder pumps? Why are we doing this? The lake line works fine. And this seems like a complicated solution. So although we had done an alternatives analysis previously, um, it was not very familiar to the residents. So explaining that there was an analysis and study done specifically to select the solution um, was helpful in them understanding why this is a good option for this community. So the things that we emphasize were protecting the lake. Um, these people really enjoy living right on Lake Washington and want it to be a clean and healthy lake for years to come. Um, also discussing the maintenance difficulties. Most of these people were around in 2018 and saw that cleaning project and how difficult it was. So they understand that it's really difficult to access the system. Then also getting into those other deciding factors like cost, constructability, and the permitting obligation to try and get the system out of the lake. Next item of concern that we heard was who's responsible for owning and maintaining the system. So the city of Renton owns, maintains, and operates the existing lake line system. Most, but not all of the properties have a blanket easement for the city of Renton to do so. Um, the snapshot here is an example of what that easement language looks like, but it does include altering or reconstructing the utility. So essentially the city has taken the approach that um, they are altering and reconstructing the lake line system to replace it with this individual lift station system. And the plan is that the city of Renton will own and operate these individual lift stations, although they are on private property. The next item of concern was whether these individual lift stations have any monitoring capabilities. Um, the site plans that we put together were preliminary and just citing the stations, but one of the first questions that we got was about monitoring. Um, so we had not made a decision one way or the other when, when we had those meetings, but um, they were concerned about the monitoring. Some of these residents are not home for you know, weeks or months out of the year and are concerned this, whether or not they'll be able to observe whether the stations are functioning when they're not there. So this is just an example of one of the types of systems that we're considering, but they are able to monitor pump performance. Um, they can transmit alarm conditions via a cell network. They don't need to be hardwired into a phone system. Um, and they can also be programmed to send automatic alerts um, to whoever you want to contact, including city staff. And 
next item of concern that we got was for shared stations. Uh, there are a lot of properties like this one here where they share an existing lake line lateral. Um, and, and our initial design approach was that if there's really limited space available and they share an existing lateral, then we may consider putting one shared larger station for those two properties. Um, the thought being it's one less station for the city to own and operate and maintain forever. So this was an item of concern with the residents, however, they thought that it was a significant increase in liability between their two properties. Um, some of them were not aware that they shared existing laterals, but once that was brought up, um, it was an item of concern to them. So we revised our design to only share stations if there truly is no place to put it on one property. And we, we only have a, one or two of those left. The next uh, item of concern that we heard a lot about was emergency storage of these systems. Uh, the lift stations are not intended to be a storage system, but there was a lot of confusion with septic systems. There happened to be a couple of residents who have septic systems at other properties. And so they're used to tanks with storage of thousands of gallons. And then we come in with a little pump station like this and they think it's uh, way undersized, even though it's not supposed to be a storage system. So the conclusion, or the tanks, the pump stations were initially sized based on the water billing records for these properties. And the size was selected uh, based on a minimum of about 12 hours of storage during normal use of their water system. So if there, were, if there was a power outage that was less than, less than 12 hours, the system would be able to handle it. Um, but this was a pretty big sticking point. So what, what we decided was to provide the largest station that we could to provide more storage just as a buffer in an emergency situation. Uh, the next item of concern, and this was by far the biggest one, was what are we doing for backup power? Uh, this ties into the emergency storage question as well. Um, one thing to note is that the existing pump and flush stations don't have on-site backup power. Um, the city of Renton brings out a trailer-mounted generator to run those during a power outage, but from the resident's perspective, there is no interruption to their sewer service when the power goes out. And again, this is only, the, the pump stations do have some storage enough to provide 12 hours. Most of the power outages do not last 12 hours, but the ones that do are, are the ones that the residents remember. So we started looking at our um, different options for uh, backup power. The options that we considered were portable generators. So similar concept to how the existing flush and lift stations are operated. Um, but with small individual uh, portable generators uh, where the city would have to come out and pump down each of the individual lift stations during a power outage. Um, obviously, this is pretty labor intensive and the access to the stations is somewhat difficult given that they're in people's backyards. Um, it's not, so that access needs to be coordinated in order for that to happen. The second option that we looked at was a battery or solar backup. Um, but the problem that we were running into there is that these lift stations, while they don't require a lot of electricity to run, um, they have a high inrush current, so a high demand just to kick on. And the only commercially available battery that could handle it happens to be a Tesla Powerwall. Um, it needed two units in order to be able to run these, this system. Um, they're significantly expensive and, and a little bit hard to find. The third option that we considered uh, was a central backup generator and distribution system. So this would be either a permanently mounted generator or a generator port in some central location that would have a wired connection to each individual lift station to power those during an outage. The city had some concerns with this approach um, as it's sort of a city operated electrical network, which is a little bit unusual, especially for the wastewater department but they do have you know, the traffic signal and street lighting networks 
uh, within the city. So in that way, it's, it's somewhat similar. Before I get into the selection of, of the backup power, I'll also talk about the power for normal operation. So I mentioned that on the original site plans, the uh, preliminary concept was that the lift stations would be fed by the residential uh, electrical connections. This would be by installing a new dedicated sub panel for the individual lift station, um, but just connecting to the residential power. So the cost of running the lift station would be billed directly to the resident because it goes through their existing meter. Um, we, we're talking about a cost of maybe $5 a month to run the system. It's not a significant cost, but it is a new additional cost. The second option that we were considering is branching off the existing residential service. Um, this would have to be a, a separate service and meter just for the lift station, but we're running into complications with the electrical service provider that didn't want to have two separate meters for a single address and trying to reconcile that from a billing perspective. Which brings us to our third option, which was a central electrical distribution system. So this would require a centrally located transformer this is uh, the Kennedale, Kennedale Beach Park, which happens to be city-owned property in the middle of the service area. Um, the system could, the biggest advantage to this is that the system could easily be designed to have a permanent generator or generator connection port. So the same hardwired network that would provide backup power could also provide um, the normal operation power. And in that way, you wouldn't have any connection to the resident's electrical service system. Um, this way, there would also only be a single metered location where the cost for running the entire system could be billed directly to the city instead of to the individual residents. So because this option solved both the normal operation and the backup power at a reasonably cost-effective approach while addressing all the residents' concerns about backup power, uh, this was the option that was selected. Thanks, Cheyenne. Um, I, I just saw the 10 minute card come up and we just got to the fun part. Now, what do we do? Right? You know, so as a city, you know, we have, uh, we have to figure out how to pay for this, how uh, to explain it to the other rate payers. Um, it, it's, it's a big challenge. So uh, the cost per foot to do this work is almost 10 times what it would be for a normal uh, R&R project. Uh, and it, it's just a fact of the way it is. Uh, but we knew this coming in, you know, you saw some of the timeline on here that we've been looking at it a long time. So we've included a lot of these costs in our uh, rate studies that we've done up to this point. So we've uh, pushed off some of our R&R &R projects or, or minimized them, and we put a focus on this project. So uh, really, in the end, our rates are accommodating this just fine. We're not intending to charge any additional uh, surge charge to these properties for the what may be perceived as an additional service. They have had the system they've had for years. We need to maintain that as a city. So that's what we're gonna provide. And that kind of hits the last bullet point there is it's, it's really, we bought the responsibility when we accepted that lake line years ago. So uh, now we get into the, you know, the real, it's just weird stuff to have to deal with, to be honest. You know, you're dealing with how do you get on people's properties? How do you write the easement up? Okay, well, I'm another neighborhood neighbor in town, and I have a grinder pump. Why aren't you working on mine? Um, how do you keep that separation? How do you write it into code? Uh, how do you make it very clear to all the residents what what your plans are? We're working on it. We don't have the answer yet. You know, we're still early in the project, but uh, it's something we need to answer. And um, the backup power, you know, you, we uh, it floored me to know that having a separate electrical system to run all these pumps was actually a cost-effective option for us. And it solved a lot of the problems with the homeowners by being able to have a central backup generator, or even if it's on a trailer to help support, um, support the battery backup or support backup for the pump stations. So moving forward, we, uh, we're gonna, as we stated earlier on with the timeline, we're gonna conclude the 30% the design. We're, get, we're working hard on that, uh, which, um, is gonna set us up for, a, actually, I think we might even submit the permit sooner than that 
we have enough information, figure out how to abandon uh, the existing lake line that's there. We need to go through that process. If it's a, a, a nationwide permit, then it's not as bad as if we need an individual permit, which we need to plan for. It could take uh, 18 months or better to process that through. And we're at a point right now where we're, we're already thinking about moving on to next steps. You know, you saw the timeline. It's, it may seem like a little while, but it's gonna come up on us quick. So we're looking for next steps in the design process. I personally like that graphic because it feels like that every day I work on this job. <laughs> so with that, um, I'm assuming we have a little bit of time for Q&A. All right, I'll get the thumbs up. Now, remember, if you have a question, we do have people online and there's a mic in back. And that also gives me time to run off the stage and leave Cheyenne here. <laughs> Let's open it up. If, uh, we need to use the mic though. I need to make you as nervous as I am. Yeah, I have two questions for you. Uh, did anybody say no? They haven't yet. Okay. But you know how construction goes in, in projects like this, we haven't put a shovel in the ground yet. Well, yeah, that's understood. But uh, you know, sometimes you have uh, folks that are going to dig their heels in and then what are you going to do? I'm just saying something to think about. Oh, no, we've, we've, we certainly have thought about it. It's, it's, um, we're working on things in our, that to have in our back pocket should that arise. Right now, everybody sees the benefit because if it breaks, they don't have any other options. I mean, they can't live in their house, they can't flush their toilet. And that's not just them, that's all their neighbors too. And what does that do for your multi-million dollar house? Right. So um, it, it, we're, we're, we're here <laughs> as government, we're here to help. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, we, we are actually trying to be proactive on this so that they can maintain their property. And do you have uh, any idea how much lake water you're not going to be taking out once this is uh, in place? I do not. Okay. Thank you. Um, was there a concern about aesthetics and how long will the construction project take for each property? Um, I can talk about aesthetics. I don't know about the duration for each property, but uh, the aesthetics, you know, um, it is an issue. I I've heard from other agencies too, where uh, the homeowners see this lid and they try to decorate it so they can't see it, which can be interesting the way they decorate it. So uh, it's something that we're gonna have to be very clear about with property owners uh, so we can maintain access. If they want us to maintain it, we need to have access to it. And then the other one was for duration for each property for construction. I'd just be guessing at this point, but um, probably a couple of weeks, week to two weeks per property. And I don't know if it's gonna be how they're gonna go about pulling it together, but like I said, I'm just guessing at this point. I have a question. Um, you showed electrical panels on the sides of houses and that is from their, their boxes or is that from the power grid that you're running? That is, that is individual. Um, that's what's on the houses now. It's the, 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 the real life, what they have for electrical service now. Mm -hmm. One of our big concerns was you're, you're dealing with 54 homes that have been built at different times over the years, maybe remodeled, maybe not, maybe added on to. And we have some big concerns about and risks associated with trying to even attempt to tie into those electrical boxes. And that's where the cost starts balancing out with running our, our own electrical system that, that factors into it, the unknowns, the risk. Okay, my next question has to do with the easement because you're gonna have a power box on the wall of the house. You're gonna have a force main traversing their yard. You're gonna have a pump station out there somewhere. Are you just going to ask for blanket permission to go anywhere on their yard with your easement, or are you going to write a prescriptive easement with a specific boundary? I don't, I don't think there's any way to write a prescriptive easement for what we're trying to do. I think a blanket one with yeah. some restrictions on it so that the homeowner feels comfortable. Uh, we, I don't think we're going to be able to just charge out into their backyard while they're sunbathing and work on their um, work on the grinder pump. We're going to have to give notice, and all that should be written into the easement so it's clear what the expectations are. Thank you. Uh, uh, Eric's reminding me we currently have a blanket easement, although I bet many of them don't remember it. So we'll, we'll have to work on that. Yes. I was curious what the estimated cost 
per property was at the 30% design and how and how that compared to your estimates when you were looking at the alternative. You know, I'm just pulling this off the cuff, which is always dangerous to do, but I believe it was in the $10 million range for all of the entire project, not per home. I don't have it broken out that we can do the math easy enough. I was close to 25 million for the in water and the other one that was further out was 50 million. So it was, it was, it's a substantial cost savings to do the grinder pumps. I have a question about the uh, alternatives analysis, and I was curious about whether you reached out during that stage to the permitting agencies, was a core primarily, um, and whether they, you know, their input was a big factor in uh, your decision to not do the in water. I think you mentioned Cheyenne that that uh, you have an, an alternative that's not in water. You have to go with that. Could you elaborate a little bit more? Did that come from the permitting agencies? I'm going to need some help on that one because I wasn't with the city when we did the alternatives analysis. Do you recall if that was Sam? Okay. I also was not on this project when that alternatives analysis will happen, but that's working with our environmental permitting consultant. And it just if you can, if there's a technically feasible option that also happens to be the most cost effective option that reduces the risk of harm to the lake. Um, it's hard to make a case otherwise to put it back in the lake. Um, there have been other communities in Lake Washington that have successfully permitted reconstruction of portions of the lake line, um, one city in particular. Um, but in that case, they were able to, it was an active leak in the lake line. So they were able to demonstrate that the potential lawsuits from the homeowners would delay the project long enough that that was the environmental risk. Um, and so, they were able to replace the lake line to prevent further environmental damage versus converting to a different system. Awesome, great job. Uh, we are out of time for this session. So thank you again and uh, great presentation. <laughs>